What's up, Lunatics? I'm Moon Spirit, and you know something? Anime is awesome! And we have to thank the anime that made it possible, Astro Boy! Astro Boy was the creation of Osamu Tezuka, a Japanese legend. He is heralded as the father of manga, godfather of manga, and even the Japanese Walt Disney. Throughout his life, he has made several hit series, Kimba the White Lion, Blackjack, and Dororo. If that name somewhat rings a bell, then you should know of its recent anime adaptation. Though the art heavily departs from its original depiction, but it is mostly faithful to the manga from what I gather. But Astro Boy is his most iconic work as it laid the foundations to what anime is today. It has been adapted not just in the 60s, but also in 1980, 2003, and in 2009 when Hollywood gave him a shoddy animated feature film. I personally don't know much about Astro Boy, but I do respect its legacy. However, there is one thing I will say about him. He has a great GBA game called Astro Boy Omega Factor. I didn't grow up with the GBA, so I did the next best thing. Emulate. Yeah, I know, to some y'all it's a taboo topic. Out of all the games I played back then, Astro Boy Omega Factor was one game that stuck out the most. It left such a huge mark on me, so I had to get it physically, thanks to eBay. But holy shit, I lucked out because look at the prices on this baby! But how was this game great? Simple, it was developed by Treasure Games. You know, the developers of Genesis classics like Gunstar Heroes and Dynamite Heady? I know, right? Check out my vid on Dynamite Heady later. And for this review, all footage you see here was recorded on the GBA Consoleizer. This is not a sponsored take. I'm just telling you how awesome this baby is. And if you're interested, links are in the description down below. But anyway, it's been a long time since I played this game. So, is this game still as great as I remembered it? Or am I just blinded by nostalgia? Well, let's put on our jet boots as we're about to blast off. This is Astro Boy Omega Factor. Dr. Tenma's son, Tobio, was tragically killed in a freak car accident. He vowed to bring him back to life by placing his memories into a robot. That robot became Astro Boy, but it seems Dr. Tenma mysteriously disappeared, as Astro is welcomed to the new world by Dr. O'Shea. But Dr. Tenma does show up occasionally being mysteriously evil or a dick for mysteriously evil or dickish sakes, you know, like in some anime. <laughs> Throughout the game, Astro goes on a huge adventure and meets many people, so I'll do my best to condense what goes on in this first playthrough. Yes, first playthrough. I'll explain later. It starts with saving Dr. O'Shea's assistant, Watto, while meeting Atlas, another robot who will be Astro's rival, then stopping an artificial sun and meeting Pook, a transforming robot who reluctantly works for a crime boss. After that, there's meeting private detective Wally Kisaragi, who will play a huge part in this game. Then helping Dr. Tokugawa, one of the wealthiest men on Earth, save his son Daichi on his moon plant, only to find out that Daichi is Atlas since Daichi was long dead, and finding a mysterious girl in some sort of chamber. Once that is all done, there's going to Antarctica to meet robot advocate Duke Red, his robot daughter Nuka, and President Rag, the first robot president, and stopping an anti-robot organization named Black Lux, your leader Dead Cross, who's revealed to be Rag's human master named Rock. It's complicated, the game explains it better. And lastly, there is being transported 35,000 years into the ancient Mu Empire by an evil three-eyed psychic named Sharaku. But the end game culminates when Astro and Wally return from Shoraku's time exile, find Earth in a war between robots and humans after President Rag was assassinated. Robots have ruled the world, exterminated 80% of the world's population, and Astro is forced to fight against the world's strongest robots to stop the war. But as soon as Astro defeats them all, he confronts their leader Shadow, but is revealed to be Sharaku, thanks to a special potion that granted him time travel powers. Apparently, he used the war to try to take over the world, but... There was a huge sling that has prevented him from doing so in all the timelines he encountered. The Death Mask, an astronomically huge robotic face proclaiming herself as the Goddess of Justice. There, it casts death on all robots using a substance called Omotanium that can instantly kill robots. Just as Sharaku transcends through time to escape, the game ends as Astro and all robotic life is wiped out as the credits roll on a ruined Earth. 
But that doesn't mean the game is over. Oh no, lunatics, the game has just begun. That's right, that was a fake out ending. In fact, just after the credits roll, a celestial being known as the Phoenix comes in and revives Astro. There, Phoenix grants Astro a second chance to save the world and bring peace to both humans and robots, granting him the ability to transcend time. And now the game truly begins as you start again from the beginning, and the ability to stage select. So now, this game is now a time traveling adventure to save the planet. Man, such an adventure on such a small cartridge. Reminds me of Golden Sun. <gasps> hey! May I should do that next time! For a GBA title, this is a very well crafted game. Every single character looks amazing and are faithful to Osamu Tezuka's work. But if you're taken aback by the art looking too Disney like compared to what anime looks like then and now, bear in mind that this was from the 60s and Tezuka's work was inspired by Walt Disney's work. The art for this game is based off the 2003 Astro Boy remake, which explains the cleaner look. Though while the game looks great, the game does have slowdown when there's too many enemies on screen, but I say that's a good problem to have to be honest. Controlling these enemy hordes is important, and this slowdown can help give you a bit of a reprieve, and the American port, from what I gather, fix the Japanese original's more frequent slowdown. As Astro Boy, you must contend with many types of hostile robots and anti-robot human supremacists. While the only difference between them are color swaps, their colors do define who they are. We have melee boys, shooty boys, and tough boys. But they also come in tiny or huge sizes too, including the humans. Not surprising to see robots like that, but the humans too? I mean, I know it's a future and all, but god damn! The levels are a big bag though. Some stages have fixed gravity, some have auto scrolling. Overall, the levels are varied, but just alright. I do really like the first level in the city because it has billboards and signs that reference Sega and Gunstar Heroes. I do not like the Mu Empire pyramid climb because you have to deal with bullshit giant robo wheel faces that will hit you like a truck, even though they move as slow as a steamroller. As for the sound department, it does surprisingly well for a GBA game. There isn't much to talk about except that hearing your enemies being knocked down is music to my ears. No really, the sounds of bad guys getting knocked back and a musical scale being played, and some of the music is surprisingly catchy when I was listening to them by itself. But this is treasure, and we can always expect high quality soundtracks. So, to give you a taste, let's dance. game is one hell of a beat em up and shoot em up. That's right, this game is two genres in one, and it plays out nicely. But first, let's talk about the beat em up aspects. Rocky and Sakiti's robots just feel right, especially since crowd control is manageable thanks to maneuvers like kicking, which can knock back enemies. Astro doesn't just throw punches, but can fire lasers from his fingertip, allowing him to destroy rows of enemies. But nothing feels more gratifying than using all these moves than cornering them in for a satisfying combo. And I do like the change of pace when Astro becomes a horizontal shooter, 
since he has jets in his feet. And the laser is so good when shooting down bogeys, but be mindful because Astro is kind of big, which means he has a big hitbox. And if he ever gets caught in a sticky situation, he can jet dash to dodge out of harm's way, if you're quick enough. Luckily, this dash also applies to when he's on the ground too, and thank god for that, otherwise Astro Boy would be a kiss sized punching bag. Thankfully, Astro has some special moves in his repertoire. Well, EX moves to be exact. The first is the Arm Cannon, where Astro opens his arm to fire a giant laser and it's the best because who doesn't love giant lasers? The EX dash turns Astro's jet dash into a living battering ram and you can mow down whatever it is in your path like a freight train. And if you time it right, it's perfect for hitting multiple enemies or a huge guy. Oh, and you're invisible while doing it too. Nice. The last one is a machine gun he hides inside his back. Even though it looks like it comes from his butt, it doesn't. Well, at least in some iterations. But anyway, the machine gun hits everything on screen, but I hardly use it at all since why use a machine gun when you got lasers? Though it is helpful in the shooter stages because you can cancel out enemy attacks and move out of the way. But then again, the machine gun might have been better if I made it stronger. Oh yeah, Astro Boy can be stronger thanks to his Omega Factor, which is his soul per se, allowing him to upgrade his attacks, moves, and health. To get stronger, he imprints everyone he meets on his journey into his soul, allowing him to increase his attributes. And I mean everyone, good and bad, and you'll have ample opportunities to level up Astro. The one attribute that seems inconsequential at first is the sensor mode, but it does help you see better in darkness and fog, and you'll eventually need to level it up to further the plot. And once you do get to know each of these characters, you can go to the character list and the options menu to get a lot of interesting trivia behind each one. I personally recommend it only because it's good to know Tezuka's footprint on the world. But the real hallmark of a treasure game are the boss battles. Every one of their fights are amazing and varied. Other than just fighting giant robots, you'll face an artificial sun which can grow and lash out solar flare-like tendrils, Puku can transform into animals, and Shiraku can summon deity-like creatures. And remember the world's strongest robots? Their names really live up to their reputation, though three of them are kinda pushovers if you know what you're doing. But watch out for Epsilon because he can summon sea creatures like a dolphin brigade and a blue whale to ruin your day. Hey, it's not every day you get your ass handed by someone who can summon a giant whale to your gob. But Pluto? He's one tough son of a bitch. Speaking of tough, this game can be difficult if you don't choose your upgrades wisely. If you're not too careful, even some of the small fry will kick your ass, so don't get cocky. And as the game progresses, the enemies become more relentless and can hit harder. Even the bosses will ruin your day, especially Pluto. First time finding him? It wasn't too bad. But round two? Pluto might as well have put my ass off planet because he dominated me for over 20 minutes in what should have been a 2 minute fight, even though I fully upgraded my health. So prepare to die in this handheld game. A lot. Yep, this is the Dark Souls of Astro Boy games. At least if you die, you can always retry since there are no lives or continues. The game, however, does have a score system that encourages better plays because once you die, your high score goes to zero. If you want to flex your leaderboard stats on this game, somewhere out there, go nuts! Okay, I did put a timestamp if you wanted to skip to the conclusion, but this really is your last chance to skip because there's a whole lot happening from here on out. And I'm going to try my best to explain what happens in depth, so this is your final warning. Got it? Okay, now here we go. While the game mostly plays the same beats, it's a different timeline as now the world is against robots, and a new face has made things worse for robots. Counselor Drake, and he vows to destroy any robot if they do not accept their roles as tools for humans. Jeez, really hitting too close to home here. But to save the world, the Death Mask and Counselor Drake are the keys. Astro discovers that the Death Mask was created by Duke Red and Mr. Tokugawa, as a means to stop the robots if things go wrong. It's complicated to fully explain Duke Red's motives, but he makes an excellent point about why he made the Death Mask, especially since his solution is technically a non-partisan solution. It hits deep, and I kind of respect his way of thinking, but I'm only abridging this, so play the game to fully understand the context. Duke Red also reveals that Nuka powers the Death Mask, and she will judge the robots of the world. 
Blue Knight, the Robot of Vengeance, intervenes and vows to destroy Nuka slash Death Mask to protect the robots, but Astro doesn't want that to happen as he trusts Nuka's judgement, so Blue Knight challenges Astro to a duel to test each other's resolve, to which Astro wins and Blue Knight submits and trusts in Astro and Nuka, not before telling Astro that he must reform Drake. Turns out many years ago, Drake's daughter, Prime Rose, was sick with a rare disease and only one doctor was skilled enough to cure her, Dr. Blackjack. She was put in an artificial hibernation chamber while he went on to search for Dr. Blackjack, but a robot apparently kidnapped her and sent her to the moon, where she is assumed dead, and motivated him to become counselor to destroy all robots. But she is not dead because she's the mysterious girl in the moon plant from Atlas's battle. So after much sleuthing and talking to the necessary NPCs, yeah. You'll need a guide for this part of the game. Astro finds out that Dr. Blackjack has been blackmailed into not doing his duty since his daughter is held hostage. But after saving her and destroying a humongous robot that can one-hand kill you, Dr. Blackjack is free. But even after all of this, why would someone prevent Dr. Blackjack from doing his surgical duties? Thanks to Astro Boy's super electronic brain, he deduces that it was all the work of Sharaku. Because if Dr. Blackjack cured Drake's daughter, he wouldn't hate robots, which would have prevented the war of robots and humans from happening. Whew! And we're not even at the climax! See what I mean? That a lot goes on in this game? As Astro Boy shows Dr. Blackjack to the moon plant to perform Prime Rose's surgery, Drake makes his move. After being informed of Duke Red's location, by Sharaku most likely, by threatening Nuka to show herself, or he'll detonate an anti-proton bomb to destroy the entire planet in three hours. Give a man nothing to lose, and he'd sooner sacrifice the world for the loss of one life. Crazy, not stupid. So now it's up to Dr. Blackjack to go double time and cure Prime Rose. But not before Atlas intervenes to fight Astro because of course he wants to. God damn it, Atlas! A surgery is in session and you wanna brawl? <sighs> Talk about rude. Just after the fight, and before Drake sets the bomb off, Prime Rose awakens and tells her father that she is alive and well. Many things happen that I won't bore you with, but the world is saved, and Nuka is relieved to see that all humans and robots finally live in peace. Too bad Sharaku spoils the celebration and moves in to kill Nuka. Asteroid confronts Sharaku for one final battle to save Nuka and the world, but not after another twist. It turns out that the Omotanium that substance that is deadly to robots and powers the death mask is actually living metal. Wait, you mean like T-1000? Well, no. It's an ancient and powerful cosmic creature named Garen, whose limitless power is thought to be able to reform stars. And according to Sharaku, that was the Mu Empire's treasure, and Pook is the key to control Garen. Yikes. Bad transliteration there. Pook reveals himself and turns into its true form, Pick, and becomes the heart of Garen as the true final battle begins. In fighting Garen, this titan that looks like Ultra Instinct Beethoven is hard to beat, though probably not as hard as second round Pluto, but still hard. And after finally defeating Garen, Nuka tells Astro that Garen's pieces are falling into the sun, which will cause a massive explosion, and the only way to stop it is to send her into the sun since her Omotanium reactor core can stabilize it. Astro reluctantly abides, but he decides that he will sacrifice himself too to save the Earth, saying that he'll always be with her. Yeah, forgot to mention he has the hots for Nuka, but a lot of plot happened and I'm trying to end this. Soon as Astro and Nuka enter the sun, it stabilizes and the world is saved, with both Astro and Nuka gone. But it's not the end for them, as the Phoenix intervenes again, congratulates them for their efforts, and rewards them by reviving them both. And the game finally ends as Astro and Nuka head back to Earth. But there are two post credit scenes after this. The first is a past conversation between Dr. Tenma and his then-alive son, Tobio, where he waxes his philosophy about mankind, robots, and how Astro got his name. Then, as he gazes at the stars, he waxes more schmaltzy stuff you hear a lot in anime, and that Astro must succeed beyond mankind. Even though he's been kind of a dig most of the game, his monologue is touching. But the last post credit scene is Chiraku and Pook bantering on what to do next since their plans are foiled, until Dr. O'Shea's apprentice, Wato, sees the two. Before Shiraku can use his psychic powers on her, Wato applies a bandage on his third eye, thus sealing Shiraku's powers once and for all. And he seems... fine with it. If you couldn't follow most of the plot, I apologize because explaining everything would take way too much time for this video. But man, even after all these years, my memories of this game were validated. 
Game's still good. That's why Astro Boy Omega Factor is a skyrocketing win. Granted, the game does have some frame rate issues and it can be a tad bit difficult, but that hardly detracts from all the good this game has. The combat both on the ground and air is wonderfully executed, the sprite work is amazing, and the boss battles are just exquisite. Good luck finding this game for cheap, but I assure you guys that this game is worth it. This is one tiny game that has rocketed to the skies. But that's all the time I have for you all today, so be sure to like this vid, subscribe, and share it across the web. Would you kindly? Till then, I'm Moon Spirit saying good night.